I think you'll find that the subject of the book, like the author, is fierce, forthright, and quite wry. It's a genuine pleasure to welcome Lorene Carey. I'm delighted. The first is always very scary. <laughs> very scary. I've been trying to figure out what, what to read. So I'll just start at the beginning. Thank you, Andy. Thank you, Free Library. Um, this, this, is, this is my library. I love this place, right? This is where the, yeah. And this is, this is home. It's so wonderful to see so many people that I've lived with and worked with. I'm very grateful, very grateful for you to be here tonight. Why was it that weekends at Nana Jackson's felt like a world apart? Maybe because dressed in old ball gowns, I traveled with the sun patch across the floor of the suburban New Jersey neo-colonial and soaked in more light and lux than my parents' West Philadelphia apartment could ever offer. Delight and time, the wide-armed fragrant mimosa to climb in summer, the fireplace to stoke in winter, and choices all the day long whatever your little heart desires. Yes, 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 I knew I was being spoiled. That word that obsessed black grown-ups and even kids. What could be worse than to be spoiled? Ruined by indulgence, incapable of withstanding hardship as we had done and would do in future. We were brought up by hand as surely as Pip in Great Expectations and much prouder of it than he. You spoil could get you a beat down, a corrective beat down fast. Besides, everybody needed to respect authority, learn limits, and above all, to know that older people valued you, that they loved your undeserving black behind enough to bring you back from wrong to right. I knew myself to be a wimp a failure in the toughness category, which was why I went insane with terror at the sound of my mother coming for me, or my father reaching for the threatened, though seldom used, belt. If a kid down the street got a beating, and our cheek by jowl row houses, we all heard every one. If they got beat, I'd be good for a month. <laughs> so, Believe you me, as my mother would say before administering some firm guidance by hand, I knew, I knew good and well that my whole Nana deal was off the charts, spoiled. Which was why with peers, I kept it to myself. What happened in West Collingswood stayed in West Collingswood. Nana's weekend abundance did not feel unconditional by any means. Our contract was that I would occupy myself while she got things done, and then she'd spoil me. But the time alone felt more like Sabbath, as if God visited me occasionally in those sun patches and let me curl up to its presence. One of my earliest memories with Nana at her house anchors the rest. I wanted a drink of water and went in the kitchen. Nana wasn't there, so I reached for a glass. They were small Libby juice glasses, diner style, wavy and thin enough to feel beautiful in my hand. I forget whether I climbed up to reach the metal cabinet that opened with a ping, or if I found the glass on a counter. Either way, I knew it was too high for me. And as I knew it, the tiny tumbler dropped from my hand onto the linoleum where it crashed into sharp pieces. Fear flooded me from scalp to gut. My mother had warned me to behave well on these weekends. She sent just right outfits perfectly laundered so I'd look like somebody cared. She instructed me how to make my hair twists last overnight because Nana, with her straight hair, never could comb mine right. That is, fuzz and naps pull back hard enough to straighten them. <laughs> <laughs> Above all, I was to do there what I had learned at home, to anticipate what was correct and do it before 
Nana had to ask. Now instead, I chattered one of the thousand glass hazards in this breakable house with its bric-a-brac ceramic white faces and Chinese antique stuff everywhere. All things I was usually careful to look at but not touch, except for the Chinese doll which Nana would take down on the cabinet and let me hold in her presence. I'd get in trouble with Mommy for failing to be careful and that would be bad, but I was used to it. What was worse, though, was that I had broken the spell. I'd wrecked the charm of my magical place. Nana would be angry, and I would no longer be the trusted, free-range granddaughter, free to play records over and over and pick out tunes on the piano and dress up and roam freely to sing and draw, make up stories in the middle-class museum of her house and garden. I could hear her rushing down the carpeted steps, my gut wrenched with dread. Oh, honey, she asked when she stepped into the kitchen. What happened? I knew I should admit the wrong and apologize, but how could I? The metal cabinet pressed cold against my back. Nana looked back and forth, frowning, inspecting the scene like a diorama. She could see my original misjudgment, and worse yet, the moment of willfulness, when I knew better, but grabbed at the glass anyway. I was crying by now, that's what you get. I think I started apology blubber. <laughs> Nana took my right hand, turned it over, and then smiled. I thought you had cut yourself, she said, clearly relieved. We can always get another glass, but we can't get another hand, can we? Sabbath had returned, not a charm, but a piece we could choose. She never hit me. And yet this person who provided kindness and delight to my sister and me was at the same time the woman of whom my father, her only child, once said she never loved me. As I moved into adulthood, Nana showed me more sides of herself, even so that I understood, even as I grieved, why she and my father, who had seemed inseparable, had stopped speaking. What was love among them or us? And had it ever been real? I'm writing to find out. I want not to forget but to recall how the end of my grandmother's life pulled into focus her 101 years on earth, the part we shared as well as the earlier life she brought with her into ours. I want to keep company with other families who've lived through and are living in the intense and demanding time of hospice. We underwent a mashup of fear and mortality. She was dying, then living again, then dying, and memory and love. I want to understand it because it is only love as the Song of Solomon assures us that is strong as death. I'd like to just uh, do a few uh, bits. When my grandmother came uh, to live, she'd been living in her house in New Jersey by herself. Um, and this, this is after she went into the hospital for an infection. Um, and that night, uh, I stayed with her for two nights. On the third night, she said she was so much better, I should go home to my family, she'd be fine. And we kept rehearsing where the little button was to call the nurses. And uh, when I got there the next morning, uh, she was wet, her bed was wet, and the nurse, the, um, the, the little hose that attaches, what, what is that called? Is it a catheter that attaches to the wall? No, no. <laughs> you, have, you squeeze a little thing, and it goes into the wall. This is why I read rather than talk, right? Um, the cable, the cable um, had been pulled out of the wall. Um, so this is 
this is when I found it and, and went there that next morning. Standing next to her bed in the hospital, I wanted to go find the nurse supervisor and show her that, the, here it is, that the call button cord, it's just a cord. Whew. What a rookie move, boy. That the call button cord had been yanked out. But I couldn't leave Nana to marinate in a wet bed, wishing she were home. Here, help me to go to the bathroom. On the door was a sign in thick black letters, fall risk. Nana squinted at it. What does that say about me? Uh, it's just their warning about falling. They put the same designation on a bracelet around her wrist, and when I rolled the IV stand to one side and lent her my arm, she stood flat-footed, mouth set, as if to give the lie to their signs. Well, of course she was a fall risk. Now that had been a fall risk for years. Could have been one of her many names, Rosalie, Lorene, Hagen's fall risk, Carrie Jackson. And only God knew how many times she had done fall down, go boom, and never told. After self-rehabbing from the not a stroke, Nana began to refer to the residual weakness in her arm as tennis elbow. <laughs> if you pointed out that she had never played tennis, <laughs> she just let out a big old laugh. Nana had worked so hard to hold on to the ways that we know ourselves as adults. We breathe on our own, we toilet ourselves, we move about of our own volition, we communicate with others, fix and eat food, handle money, live where we choose. Nana had been struggling each day to succeed. In one night, she'd lost it all. The social worker would not let her move back home, of course, and wondered whether we had a plan B. Answer, no. So next day, she's with us. She's in uh, our house in the rectory where we live. My husband was a rector of a church, and we lived in the house next door where he installed the clergy called the rectory. Barbara, the hospice nurse, visited within a day. At first, Nana wanted to have nothing to do with her, nothing, zero. Medical people asked her the same questions over and over. Hadn't anyone written down the answers? Didn't they have carbon paper anymore? <laughs> Didn't they have computers for her to see? Same damn questions. Nurse Barbara spoke to her with deference, and Nana answered in swallowed monosyllables. She told Nurse Barbara that she couldn't see the use of it. Barbara was not deterred, thank the Lord. Well, then she asked, what would Nana like to talk about? Nana told her about her father, who had raised five children after his wife's death after childbirth. She told Barbara that her father had died in his sleep. She said it as usual in her defiant, perfect death haiku. He ate his supper, went to bed, and then next day he didn't get up. And that's how you'd like it, too, Nurse Barbara said. She voiced simple compassion, clear-eyed, practiced, never complicated by pity. Nana grunted in acknowledgment. Well, I can't promise you that, but I can work with you and your family to try to see how peaceful we can make it. Finally, Nana let Barbara examine her. And as she ran her hand over Nana's back, Barbara marveled at the smoothness and suppleness of her skin. Nana said they all just liked to flatter her. When Barbara left, Nana implied that she must have been impressed by the rectory. <laughs> My husband, usually called Father Bob in the parishes he's served, says that many worship communities agree not to specify exactly what happens after death. People sit next to one another in the pews, thinking, feeling, intuiting, or assuming widely, even wildly different deaths and after deaths. 
from wings and a crown to rest to oblivion to straight up dust. What did Nana believe? <laughs> Don't get me to lie. For all the time we spent together intimately and despite my farcical attempts to create for Nana as much in-house independence as possible, I can't say what she hoped for or feared, but she did fear. In fact, Nana was terrified. Living in the rectory with vestry and prayer meetings, a weekly in-house mass service and children's gatherings gave her gladness, just as the fireplace dispelled the gloom of winter. But none of it brought ultimate comfort or what the funeral mass terms sure and certain hope. Nana liked knowing that she had a priest in the family, <laughs> which she said as if he were a possession. My sister Carol joked that Nana was, as Madonna sang, a material girl. <laughs> so how was she to imagine the extinguishing of the body? What does Bob say? She asked me after Barbara told us that hospice was for people expected to live no longer than six months. Nana asked me, almost in the same breath, to take particular care after she died of the Chinese jardiniers on the fireplace mantle, because these were probably worth the most of all of her best things. Bob says that God is love, I said, ignore, ignoring the jardinier directive. Nana sighed. As it happened, she went off hospice. She got much better. <laughs> She's doing great. Nanny used to say things like, you're taking such good care of me. I can't die. <laughs> I can't die. She didn't like to talk about death. Um, she didn't like to talk about the only time she talked about death was when we were trying to get her to sell her house so we wouldn't have to take care of the house and her. And, and she wouldn't, she wouldn't. And, and, and she said, well, what am I going to do if you and Bob put me out? <laughs> Where's the evidence? I mean, this is not a data-driven analysis. I mean, look at, our, look at our past behavior. Look at where we are. This is... Um, I said to her, if Bob and I put you out, Carol said she and Michael would take you. <laughs> Which was true. I mean, it, if anything happened. So, so then she realized she had hurt my feelings, and so she thought about it, and she came up a week or two later, and she said, well, what would I do if anything bad happened to you and Bob? So our joke was that Nana, and you could never talk about death with Nana unless it was Bob and me. <laughs> who were going to get knocked off, and then, and then she'd have to go back to her house. Oh. Um, I told myself that this whole thing would be good for our daughter, Zoe, who was still in middle school when Nana came. Our older daughter, Laura, had gone to Iowa with us when we helped my father-in-law at the end of his life. I told myself that death in the context of family, age, love, and care, rather than, say, war and violence, was a fact of life that we should share with young people, or else how could they grow into their own stewardship of life? But when we began auditioning uh, day nurses to fill in around Gertrude, who was with us for uh, two or three days a week, I realized that we'd brought more into Zoe's life than I'd had the sense to envision. The first few women from a nursing service started out their tours of duty well enough. They'd come in the morning dropped off by relatives or driving old model cars. I'd give them written or oral instructions according to how they said they liked to receive information. When I came home from work, Zoe would give me an executive summary of the day. <laughs> and because Zoe could get to me before Nana, that was the gloss I took into the room with me when I went upstairs to hear from her how one woman or another had failed to do right. <laughs> I 
I complained to a few friends. They commiserated and tried to help. One recommended an Eastern European woman whom she said had been brilliant, brilliant with a hospice patient she knew. Okay, 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 I thought. Let's try a white woman. <laughs> Who knows? Maybe Nana will behave better <laughs> long enough so that this one could figure out what she needed to do. Right from the gate, though, the Eastern European nurse let me know that she knew what she needed to do. Thank you very much. I wondered whether also I whiffed surprise, some confusion at our whole mixed race deal here on the street with the tree right in the center and a pointedly capitalized definite article, the Oak Road, which is where we lived, where the church was. Yes, of course, she'd be happy to hear what I wanted to say, but first she had questions. Does she need to be fed? Does she need to be washed? Uh, not exactly, but she needs help. Can she operate wheelchair herself? There's one down here on the first floor. Uh, do you have another upstairs? Does she have schedule? Yes, she has a schedule, and here it is, roughly. She read it too quickly. I hate it when they read the schedule that fast. But then I told myself, hopefully, the other family had loved this woman, so stop with the snap judgments. And the schedule begins, ta-da, with the lumberjack breakfast. She didn't appreciate my sense of humor. <laughs> OK, well, Nana didn't always either. So maybe that was a good sign. <laughs> now I'll make it, and we can talk to her. I'll go up myself and introduce myself. No, 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 let's wait, let's wait. You go with me. I'll just go in survey the room. I wouldn't. She should not wake up to a new person in the room, Nana would say, a stranger. Well, if you insist. She eats all this for breakfast? <laughs> Every day God sends. When we went up, the new nurse surveyed the room. She'd seen better, her eyes signified. But she looked satisfied, talked loudly, and began asking questions. Wouldn't you like to brush your teeth first before breakfast? Nana rolled a Moby Dick eye toward me. <laughs> and I said again that it was much better to let her eat first and then begin her morning ablutions. I said ablutions to make a little humor happen. No one smiled but me. <laughs> shall we go through the schedule? I asked this as Nana ate. No, I shall read through it with Mrs. Jackson because I can see she is very particular. I have a hard time with accents, Nana said <laughs> to no one in particular. Each of them made a small signifying snort. I kissed the one, nodded to the other, and went to work. Because, well, as my friend Tina says, either it'll work or it won't. <laughs> Am I good? I, I'm, I'm close. I'm close. Am I close to my time now? Shall I finish up? OK, I'll finish up there. I finish up there, and I won't get to the sad part. That's good. Okay. <laughs> oh, really? Oh, you meant I could read the sad part? They all act like they're your friends, and then they tell you read the sad part. <laughs> Bedtime ritual was a euphemism. By November, Nana was sleeping no more than a few hours at a time. I started to stay in the room with her and the dog until I heard her breathing steady. I'd go back and crawl into bed with Bob, who would wake up and ask sleepy, funny questions. You and the dog ready for bed yet? Does Nana know where the car keys are? <laughs> <clears throat> now and then he'd say one of my favorite blessings. May the Lord bless you and keep you. Lord, make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you, the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. I like to think of peace and I tried to pull it into me just as Bob folded me into the warmth of his body. As in labor, we began to pay stricter attention to the moments of rest. 
Nana would be up again in a few hours. One night I fell asleep on the toilet with the door open to her room so I could hear her. I was confused when I heard her shouting that her leg was stuck in the slat of the bed, which I'd raised after she fell a few nights earlier, going to the potty or bypassing it altogether. Hang on, Nana. How could I shout loudly enough so that she could hear me without waking Bob and Zoe? Calling and wrenching, one cellulite free leg protruding through the bed rail. I was washing my hands fast. Coming, coming, coming. She couldn't hear me. Why say it? I'm stuck in this thing. She rattled the bed, the metal bed. Terrified that she would break her hip, I touched her leg and shoulder at once. Nana, just a minute, please. Let me try to see how to get you unstuck. I know I'm stuck. Please stop pushing. Finally, she submitted to lying down and letting me roll her away from the bed rail to free the leg and put down the rail. The exertion, however, had proved too much for her bladder. The bed was wet. Come on, I said. If you sit here on the potty chair, I can change the bed. Nana asked for a basin of soapy water to wash herself while I made the bed. Irritated at having to stop, I got the basin, set it up on the folding table, put a washcloth in and a towel next to it. I took her right hand and ran them over the toilet items, toilet items, so that she could feel where they were. I kept the room dark so that our bodies would remember it was nighttime. Both of us were inclined these days to wake up and fuss. Besides, her vision was so minimal that she did most things by habit and by feel, not by sight. We moved to the sound of water and cotton. I thought the movements were soothing. I helped her into a fresh nightgown, pivot, sat back down onto the bed. What was supposed to happen was that she'd lie down on the tight, fragrant bedclothes, snuggle into the mommy blanket, blessedly still dry, and comforted, relax into the breeze of the fan at the foot of the bed. Instead, still stiffened with the same energy that had poked her leg through the rail, she sat straight and white against the nightlight and said, I'll never get back to sleep. Oh, Jesus, Nana, well, I will. We have got to sleep. Then she looked at me, her eyes dark in the nearly skeletal face. You wish I was dead. You know it. I know it. I move back to side step spittle. You do. You want me dead, don't you? Now it was raw biology, generations competing, her care versus my sleep. If she didn't get care, she'd die. If I didn't get sleep, I'd reach the end of love, find that my love for her was as conditional as I found hers had been for us? Would I begrudge her this essential sharing of life's energy? Would I find myself tempted to betray love itself as sacred and as regular as air and water, God and the breath of life? Without sleep, how could I stay in the cave of her room, once an elegant parlor, now some transitional place between life and death and spin straw into gold. I needed sleep to knit up the ragged ends of rage, of not getting my own, of never being enough to satisfy her as if I felt I hadn't satis as I felt I hadn't satisfied my parents and ancestors who demanded redemption through their offspring. She had called me out all right. I couldn't answer. It was early morning, the witching hour, to be sure, when she gave and demanded a raw, sometimes ugly honesty. Don't you? I leaned over and hissed into her ear, you are shouting, Nana, and I have been trying to empty the bucket. I cannot shout back. The family is asleep. Oh, a swallowed syllable followed me to the adjoining bathroom, showing me that she still had breeding and courtesy, as if the yelling to awaken us all at night never happened. Of course, part of me did want her dead. 
I wanted a full night's sleep without worrying about the next crisis, the next stink bug that she'd swear was a bee, which she knew and we didn't, that would sting and sting and sting her when she lay alone and vulnerable. I wanted her to take with her the demons that trailed behind her outside the windows in the trees, lighting up the landing and bouncing back and forth between the mirror and the windows where the chair rail landed. Yes, I wanted to stop the collapse of the Nana I'd known into this person whom I recognized and had been a fool not to notice before, back when she had more flesh to hide the bones and courtesy and material health to hide the fear in her heart. That heart, so many demands now as it tried to pump blood through muscle and past bone that remembered all the times over a century when she'd called for God, who had no more answered than her mother did when she was six. And so her heart pumped through the closed loop of remembered rage, no choice but to lash out against and then withdraw from anyone who did not love her perfectly. And from her mother Lizzie on through the entire century, none of us had. So yes, I did. I did want her dead, even though after she died, I stored the grief in my muscles and in my fat cells and in the marrow of my bones and in the joints where I could not reach it. And where if I did more and more service for children, for black people, I could keep it mostly undisturbed, like crystals in the joints, like liquid in a cyst that will not be absorbed. We know it's coming, Nana. I said it close to her so that she could hear me without the constant, unintended emphasis of shouting. We both know that. But listen, hey, you're still here, I'm still here. How about a snack? By now, Nana was sitting up in her bed, her flexible legs bent under the covers. Well, she pondered. I know this might sound funny coming from someone so close to death, but you want to know what's in the fridge, right? She laughed her hollow laugh. How about those fancy tarts with the fruit? Do we have any more of those? I think so. Let me go see. When I returned, we arranged ourselves around the tea table and tucked into a substantial low tea. <laughs> the small light on the night table was on. I can still see it behind her head. Now, honey, Nana said, nice and easy like old times, I have one favor to ask. Would you do something for me? I don't know, Nana. Depends on what it is. Now, don't be difficult. What's the favor, Nana? So you'll agree to do it for me? <laughs> Not before I know what it is. Well, you know I want to be cremated. Yep. Okay. Now, I want you to find where my father is buried. Just tell me, Nana, where is he buried? I took you. I don't remember. I'm sure I took you. Not since I can remember. Do you know the name? Eden, I think. Your father will know. We have a family plot. Okay, Nana, I'll ask Daddy. And we'll find the family plot. Now, I want you to get a small shovel and take my ashes. You may have to go at night. <laughs> and I want you to dig a hole and pour it in. All right? Oh, for God's sake. What? No, Nana. Why not? We went on this way for a while. My arguing that the only service a cemetery has to sell is opening plots and burying people. That digging a hole would be akin to theft. Plus, it would put the kibosh on a church service and keep other loved ones from having a moment together to express their love and grief. Nana grunted. I remembered Pop Pop, whom she refused to bury. But that's another story. Nana allowed us how she would never be able to get to sleep. I counted that sleep did not depend on bending other people to one's will. We chatted on like that as if we were improvising from a French farce. And then I told her that I finally had looked up the folk tale we'd been referring to. It was a story I've talked about several times, and we always try to remember what, what happened, what happened, what happened, and this happened. So, 
You have to give hay to the cow before she will give you a bowl of milk. And then you have to give the cat a bowl of milk before she's willing to do her part. Oh, that's right, the rat. What does a rat do? I made a big inhale sound, like she used to do before saying the whole list with deadly percussion. So the cat began to kill the rat. The rat began to gnaw the rope. The rope began to hang the butcher. The butcher began to kill the ox. The ox began to drink the water. The water began to quench the fire. The fire began to burn the stick. The stick began to beat the dog. The dog began to bite the pig. The little pig in a fright jumped over the stile. And so the old woman got home that night. <laughs> How's that for a peaceful good night, Nana? <laughs> Nana laughed. She ignored or did not hear my sarcasm. Nice. So I'll stop there. Stop there. Thank you so much for sharing. Um, after having cared for a grandmother, um, I wonder, was it difficult for you to uh, put into language um, all of those feelings? And how long did it take after she left for you to be able to articulate in writing the experience? Um, because it is powerful. It, it, it is. Nana, Nana died in 2008. I haven't been able to write it until now. It took me a while. And how long was she with you? She just lived with us for a year and a half um, because she had lived in the house by herself until she was 99. <laughs> what were you, uh, what would you have been doing in your other life uh, during that year and a half? Were you working? I was, I was, and in fact the, um, I, I was, it was the year of the big 10th anniversary shindig for Art Sanctuary. Um, I have a board member here who remembers that. We were doing everything we could to have throw the biggest deal we ever did. So that's what we were doing. I remember, you know, sitting, in fact, there's a little piece in here about Nana meeting Hannibal Lokombe, who's just done Healing Tones with the Philadelphia Orchestra. And all. Um, Hannibal took a commission from our little organization and wrote a piece about Father Paul Washington at Church of the Advocate, which was the home of Art Sanctuary. <clears throat> so we brought lots of Episcopalian um, priests who had served with Father Paul to a dinner uh, at the rectory, and we talked a, a, about it, and Hannibal asked them questions. And it was so funny. It was like the radicalization of Nana. Nana, who had never, I mean, she did not travel with the civil rights movement into black power. <laughs> she, didn't, she didn't go. But, but, what, but when Hannibal was talking to her about it, she used to say, your, your friend, the composer friend, is he coming back? <laughs> <laughs> and he would talk to her about Father Paul and the black power and the Black Panthers. And, that, is, that is good for them, really interesting. So she, she, you know, participated. So we, we, we did life. You know, Bob did church. Zoe did middle and high school. Laura did college. Uh, I taught and, um, and did Art Sanctuary. But we did, we did have, we had, you know, we did have nurses. We did have, I mean, we had a lot of stuff going on that was, was great. The various images and, uh, you know, it, uh some of those moments seem like they could have been videotaped. I mean, the, the detail and the feeling and so forth. And it led me to wonder, is your memory such that when you sat down to write this, uh, these things came to you? Or do you keep a diary uh, that helped you retain the, the detail of the moment? Uh, but I, I just, I, I love your work, so <laughs> I just wondered how you did it. <laughs> um, I think we, we have a joke in my family that one of the, one of the great gifts is that my, my husband never holds a grudge, and often he forgets whatever it was 
that was a problem, you know, like, and it's a, it's a great fact. It makes all this great compassion, you know, somebody will have done something, we say, well, you know, I know that was troublesome, and I'll say, no, he came there, he <laughs> turned the corner, <laughs> he was there, it was 10 minutes before it was, like, so somehow I have to use this for good and not for evil. <laughs> The other fact is, though, so when you write about this, when you write about something, when you spend a year or two or three or four or five thinking about the same thing, a doggone if other stuff doesn't come to you, and you, you ask people and you remember, and you say, wait, a minute, I remember, I called, I always interview other people, and I ask other people things. You know, I call my daughter and I say, well, you know the night with the bee, what the bee? And then my, oh my God, the bee! <gasps> so. So, and then I, I get help with a memory. I just want to thank you for telling your story. Uh, people have gone through this and are going through this, and I always say that um, they're silent sufferers. I mean, I really like how you articulate it. Uh, one of the things I know is that with caregivers, usually within the, um, five years after caring for someone, they suffer a major health assault. And what I want to know is, how did you take care of yourself during and after? Well, probably not well enough. Um, I like your five-year thing. I wish I had met you like 10 years ago. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. I wish I had learned that from you, even if we met each other. Um, I'm doing the math now. Um, I, 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 I don't know. Did I take care of myself, Bob? I do worship. I do exercise. I, uh, you know, it's so funny. My students are are always so articulate and love talking about, you know, self care. You gotta do self care. Um, Nana's generation did no self care. I mean that, and I think I think my generation still thinks of it a little bit like weakness. I mean, none of that is smart. And, and you can know it up here, but not know it in here, <laughs> which is where you get sick. <laughs> I do. I eat well. I exercise. I sleep a lot. I, I try to do those things. Maureen, what was the switch that said, now's the time to write this? The switch was that I wrote a, I, I wrote a a blog about it. I was starting to do a yoga practice. There you go. And um, I had an amazing moment that I actually describe in the book. It was Ash, and I called it Ash Wednesday Ashtanga. When I went to do this particular next move, and my teacher, this young woman, said, I think you can do this today. You know, sometimes you go to reading and they won't stop. And you think to yourself, I'll never get out of this room. Like, like whoever that person is, they love their own damn prose so much. <laughs> not here at the library. No, no. Other, other places, but not here. No. OK, let's, let's just find, see if I can find it and be good. Um, Okay. Mm. Ash Wednesday, the beginning of the Lenten season of reflection, precedes the ritual remembrance of Jesus' last ministry's crucifixion, the empty tomb. It's two years and a late life yoga practice let my body begin to feel Nana's loss. And the yoga's when I began to feel it. And the first writing I did linked her death to my life. That was on Ash Wednesday, too. My young yoga teacher sat down next to me and said, I think you can do this pose today. It would be my first try at uh, Marishyasana D, or Marichi's pose for short. There's an error in the book. It says C, because I couldn't believe I actually did D. And then I called the teacher after it was already in print. And she said, oh, yeah, that was D. I remember, because you got D really quick. Just. 
So if you buy all these books up and I get another edition, I'll get to fix it. Um, so you do all these things. Uh, the pose starts with the left leg in half lotus. I bend the right knee, plant my heel in front of the hip, and let my body tip forward. Then there's twisting the torso to allow the left shoulder to lie on the outside of the bent knee. The left arm wraps around the right leg and through space toward the, the rib cage. The other arm reaches around the back to catch, or as the yogis say, to bind it. Oh boy. Megan smiled with humor and compassion. Now breathe, she said. That was clearly impossible. So the voices began their suffocating comedy routine. Breathe, where, how, what's the point? Just wait out the five supposed breath count. Hold your breath, they don't call it, call it a bind for nothing. You have to breathe, Megan can be insistent. Nah, baby, not me. I did asthma in second grade with Mrs. Zuckerman. I did the Philadelphia School Reform Commission till midnight with no effing inhaler. I almost drowned at 14. You may have to breathe. Me, I can, I can fake it. Breathe into here. Megan cupped the area in the upper back that was most compressed. It's a deep brick well with pain at the bottom. I throw things into it like colonial era people threw broken crockery and rusty straightening combs into their wells. It has hurt for years and seized up completely that first winter Nana came to live with us in the rectory. Usually, despite its being omnipresent, I don't feel it. Still, it's where the lynching scene came from in my last book. It's where my video of slavery runs and runs and runs. Who could breathe into that? How do you sing Rusalka in a straitjacket or Mahalia? We breathe into the places where it feels most constricted. Damned if the full puppy dog internal spirit doesn't try. And then some air, something, some thatness happened where there was nothing before but constriction. My torso turns and the hands bind, as if not controlled by me, but by this breathing that comes into me as a triumph of discipline over good sense. Wow, Megan said, getting up to help someone else. That's great. Do five breaths there. That's what we do in yoga. We make space in the body. Thank you.